we're going to read one verse and then we're going to look at other verses in the light of that one verse in verse 21. We'll read that verse and we'll pray and then we'll get into the message this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do come before you this morning and we thank you, our gracious God and heavenly Father, uh, for your word. Father, we know that your word is forever settled in heaven. And it's true from the beginning. We know that heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will not pass away. Everything that you promised and predicted will come to pass. And I pray that through your word this morning, you'd get a hold of our hearts. I pray that your word, through the preaching of it, Lord, would do what it purposed to do in every soul here today. We pray that you'd be honoured and glorified, uh, Lord God, as the word is proclaimed in its true sense, Lord God. I pray that you'd help me uh, simply and plainly communicate your word to your people. And I pray that your people will respond in Jesus' name. Amen. This letter is written by the Apostle Paul, addressing believers in Corinth who uh, no doubt struggled in various areas. Paul visited Corinth and his second missionary journey. And Corinth was one of the most crowded or wealthiest cities in Greece. It was the major city of the Roman Empire in its day, and it was the junction of its trade and travel. And however, lust, greed, immorality uh, were rampant and permitted like it is in our day to day. But not only immorality was a dilemma, but also idolatry. Uh, Corinth was the control center of idol worship, and in particular, the worship of Venus. And from what we see or what we gather within the writings of the Apostle Paul, we see that the Corinthians were entrenched with various philosophers of philosophy, idle intellectual debates of new things, and highly regarded human wisdom. <clears throat> and so the believers in Corinth would have, without a doubt, been struggling with the old man and gravitating to these areas that they had once struggled with. And the whole purpose of Paul the Apostle writing, especially in chapter 1 as an introduction of his letter to the Corinthians, is to point out the fact that nothing compares with the plan of God and the wisdom of God. Nothing in the world compares. Especially in the plan of salvation of his son. By the preaching of his word. Like the Galatians were tempted to go back, if you will, to the law. Here we see the Corinthians were going back and gravitating to wisdom, knowledge, and arguments, thus elevating man-centeredness. And this is why Paul states in verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So he asks a series of questions. Uh, where is the wise? Where are those who are intellectual and endued with knowledge and think they're smarter than God? He goes on to say, where is the scribe? Where are the pro professors and the scholars, those who are e experts in the so-called details of the law? Where is the dispute of the world? Where are those who specialize in debates and argue philosophy and think that they can solve the problems of the world? Where are they? And so have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Absolutely. Sure, he sure has. No matter how smart a person may be or a person is, he will never, ever be smarter than God. The wisdom of man doesn't even come close to the wisdom of God. The Bible is clear in Proverbs 21 verse 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. You can never outsmart God. As a matter of fact, it was God that gave us our little pea brain. And with that little pea brain, man wants to try to be smarter than God. Think he can do a better job at it. And I want to remind you today, no one can ever do better than what God has purposed and planned before the foundations of the world and have now made it known to us through the preaching of his word. So the argument is clear. Where is the wise? Well, there is no wise man in comparison to God. There is no scribe or debater who compares to the wisdom and the will of God found in the finished work of Christ, preached amongst us. 
No one can outsmart God in his vehicle or method in, in how he uh, projects his word. God doesn't use the, the, the brain of a man. He doesn't use the, the eloquence of a man. He doesn't use the manipulative tactics of a man, but rather he uses the preaching of his word, the truth found in his book. William MacDonald said, no human wisdom or intelligence can ever discover or disprove God. No human reasoning can bring salvation. So all those who have lived by their own wisdom will be left with nothing. God had already made them look, all, look foolish and showed that their wisdom was no more than useless nonsense. For all their learning, God would show them to be fools. Their wisdom would be useless because it could not do nothing to provide salvation that can come only through the cross. In verse 21, the Bible says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So the people of this world will never know God on a personal level by the philosophy of human wisdom. Not a wise man with all his knowledge can ever know God as he is known. Uh, not a scribe or a scholar with all his learning will ever know the mysteries of God revealed in his Son apart from God. And no debater or orator with all his arguments can ever know God in an intimate way. So what is God's design? What's God's preferred model what, 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 uh, for people like you and my, me to come to know God and know the truth? What pleased him? Well, the Bible says there, it pleased God <laughs> by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I want to give you three things from our text. I want to share with you this morning the pleasure of preaching the person in preaching and the purposeful preaching. Look, let's look at the first together in our text. The pleasure of preaching. What pleases God? Well, the Bible says here, the foolishness of preaching. It's very clear from this verse that God designed uh, uh, you know, preaching as the vehicle to, to, to uh, you know, uh, convey truth and people will hear the truth uh, uh, and to know the truth and to know the God of the truth. You know, God didn't design skits, if you will. Uh, he didn't design uh, plays and musics and comics and all that as a preferred way to reach people. No, it pleased God to use preaching to reach people. Plays, personalities, pers uh, uh, presentations, visions and dreams are not uh, ever to take place uh, the preaching of God's Word. Now, a lot of people don't like preaching. They like teaching more than preaching. Pre uh, teaching is knowledge. Teaching gives you information. It, 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 it attacks the brain or the mind. Preaching attacks the heart. It brings that knowledge down to the heart and, 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 and challenges you to apply what you're taught. And a lot of people don't like preaching. You can talk about the mysteries of the Bible, you can talk about, you know, the old time saints and you can talk about numbers and genealogies and all the rest of that and people will go, ooh, ah. But as soon as you try to apply the word of God to people today, they start being schizophrenia. They shake. Ooh. Why? Be because now it's personable. Now it's challenging the heart of a man. And you say, what is preaching? Well, preaching is to herald or proclaim or publish God's given message. What God has in his word of truth. God wants people or preachers and prophets to declare it as it is. Not to change it. Not to sugarcoat it. And, and, and so preaching is not giving a talk. Uh, it's not giving a lesson. It's to herald, if you would. Announce, uplift, if you will, the truth in a very authoritative way. Sometimes teaching and preaching go hand in hand, like we're having today. We're having teaching and preaching. And, uh, and 2 Timothy 4 helps us define preaching in a more detailed way. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, uh, Paul says to Timothy this, preach the word. He's not saying talk the word. He's saying preach the word. And he says, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So re preaching requires, by the way, faithfulness. He says in season and out of season. There are times where you don't feel like preaching because you know 
that it is hard and you know the response that you may get from people. And like the days in Jeremiah, they had, were stone-faced to Jeremiah. He would preach his heart out and no one would listen. They'd be stone-faced. They'd call him the weeping prophet or the weeping preacher because people would just sit there and be stone-faced. You couldn't move them. Can you imagine trying to preach to a people like that? Not even one at that time, perhaps in all his audience would be wanting to listen or hear. And that would be so difficult. So in season and out of season, when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it, you go and preach what God wants you to preach. And so Paul is calling Timothy here to be faithful in his preaching. Rough times, good times, whether people want to hear it or whether they don't want to hear it. And then preaching requires conviction. He says he reproof. To reproof means to convict or to convince by biblically correcting error. That's what reproof is. So preaching helps expose sinful behavior, bad doctrine, and an attitude of rebellion. And then it says here, uh, 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 rebuke. So requires, preaching requires warning. That's what rebuke is all about. It's to firmly deal with sin by admonishing and warning people about their sinful behavior, listen, and the consequences thereof. A lot of people don't want to hear the consequences thereof. They don't want to hear that, oh, my sin is going to be accounted for. If I do this, this is going to happen. And so preaching helps people see their sin and their need to repent and obey the Lord and his plan of salvation. Preaching also requires passion. It says here, exalt. Exalt means to encourage others to come alongside, if you will, by preaching right biblical things. It's to plead with people. Exalting. It's to plead. Uh, it's to beseech through the preaching. It's to compel. Uh, and, 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 and it has a challenging aspect to it. Why? Because preaching has purpose. You want people to respond. You want to see people uh, uh, respond in the right way. You want to see people to repent. You want to see people come to the faith and live out the Christian life. Preaching that pleases God is preaching that convicts people to do what's right in God's eyes. But it requires patience. He says, here with all long suffering, there are some people who have hard hearts more than others. And so you can preach, and the preaching, the Bible describes it to be like a hammer that breaks the hardened heart. And so some people, their heart is harder than others. So you might, you need to be patient. Keep preaching on, keep preaching. Chip away, if you will, as long as they're there to hear it and keep going. Don't compromise the message. We live in the day to day that people are compromising the message rather than preaching with patience. Keep preaching the word. Well, they're not hearing. Well, keep preaching. You don't have to sugarcoat the message to make it uh, you know, palatable to people today. You just need to keep on preaching and preach and preach and be long-suffering to those that have hard hearts. And, uh, and there are many people that we see that have come a long way that the Bible has dealt with them graciously and helped them. And so when preachers... Uh, preach they need to pray we need to pray paul said it very clearly to timothy that he needs to pray for all men and that they'll come to the knowledge of the truth that they may be saved and so preaching with long suffering means that you pray for those that you're preaching to and so we ought not to be looking for immediate results although we'd like to see people come to the lord but we need to wait on the lord with patience you say how long ask jeremiah <laughs> Ask Jeremiah. And then preaching requires truth. He says here, with long suffering and what? Doctrine. And doctrine, divine doctrine. Doctrine that has been given to us by the inspired uh, writers, which are the apostles uh, in this book here. And so preaching should be biblically sound, healthy, you know, sounding in a way that is truth. And so people must be taught Bible truths. Truth is the foundation of our preaching. That's why it's important to have both teaching and preaching. Without sound doctrine, we have no authority to preach. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says to Timothy, all scriptures given by the inspiration of God, and notice what it's profitable for. For what? For doctrine. And for? Reproof. And for? Correction. And for instruction in what? Righteousness. Campbell once said, preaching is not the proclamation of a theory or the discussion of doubt. 
Preaching is the proclamation of the word. The truth as the truth has been revealed in the Bible. And so Paul states in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21, for it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, Paul is not simply saying that preaching is foolishness. He is saying that, you know, uh, by the foolishness of preaching. In other words, the simple preaching of the word is what pleases God. Because to some it's like foolish, or is it that simple? Or the message of the cross is foolish to those that don't believe. We'll see that later on in the message. Uh, so it, it, it's the foolishness of preaching, not with wisdom of words of men. Uh, no, the simple preaching of God's word as it is stated in the word of God. Not with the intellectual guru who is puffed up with knowledge. No, just simple preaching. <clears throat> not the debater that knows how to manipulate people with his words and get them to make a decision and play on the heartstrings of, of men. No, 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 no. The simple preaching of the word. We don't need gimmicks. We don't need, you know, the lights to be dimmed. We don't need a rock band here to play and gently, you know, uh, play as the preacher is speaking so he can pull on your heartstrings. No, we just need simple, plain, sharp, biblical, true preaching from the Word of God. The foolishness of preaching. That's what God is pleased with. Talking about the foolishness of preaching. When Jonah was called to preach in his day, the message that he was called to preach was so simple and so sharp. I want you to turn to Jonah chapter number 3, if you will. Notice what the Bible says there in the beginning from verse 1. This is the second time God called Jonah to preach the word. The first time, Jonah rebelled. He didn't want to preach to the Ninevites. And the reason why he didn't want to preach to them, because they were so wicked. He didn't want to see them come good for whatever reason that was taking place in his heart. And God would use this uh, prophet preacher, give him a second time, second chance to go and do what God called him to do. And in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, look at verse 2, arise and go. By the way, that's authority. That's authority. You say, who gives you the right to preach God's word? Well, God does. It's authority. And God gave it to the disciples before Jesus uh, was ascended into heaven, he gave him the authority to go forth and preach the gospel to every creature. And now we are byproducts of that great commission and, and continuing even 2,000 years later to do the very things that pleased God. Amen? Amen. The teaching and preaching. And he says, Arise and go into Nineveh, that great city, and uh, talk. Does it say that there? Give a talk, maybe in some modern versions it might. No, it says he preached unto it. Preaching is the avenue. It's the avenue. It's the methodology that God uses to get the word of God known out in the community. You know, when he, God called Jonah the first time in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, look at this, and cry against it. So why do preachers have to be so loud sometimes? Because God says to go and herod and proclaim and cry out, if you will. And uh, why? For their wickedness has come upon me before me. And this is what uh, Isaiah 58 tells us in verse 1. Cry out loud, prophet. Cry out loud, you preacher. Cry out loud means lift up your voice. And he goes on to say, spare not. Means don't hold back. Preach everything that God's telling you to preach. He says, like a trumpet, if you, if you will here. Like a trumpet. Make sure they hear what God tells them. Show my people their what? Transgression and their sin. In other words, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. By the way, preaching doesn't mean that you go on a rant and you foam at the mouth and spit and if you haven't preached loudly, you know, you haven't preached at all. No, preaching is preaching the truth of God's word and with conviction and passion. <clears throat> That's what preaching is. It's declaring the truth. And there needs to be some passion behind it. And he says, I bid thee, preach the preaching, he says, and preach unto it the preaching, I bid thee. In other words, we preach acceptably unto God. 
We are called to preach God's message, God's way. We ought to preach, thus save the Lord, what God commands, unashamed, boldly, without an apology, preaching, boldly the word of God. We haven't been called to change the message, watered down the message, we're called to preach it as it is. Preaching it as God said it, amen? This leads us to the next point. In verse 21, the person in preaching. It says here in verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Look at verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks, what? Foolishness. So Paul says we preach Christ here crucified. He, he's, he's the person of our preaching. This is what God wants us to preach. He wants us to preach Christ crucified. Christ, the Messiah, is the one that has power, authority, and, uh, and, 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 and strength, and rule, but crucified. Christ crucified means weakness. It means uh, humiliation, death and defeat. Man, this is a great paradox. Christ crucified, which to some people sounded foolish. What do you mean? Power and then death, victory and death. Don't, I don't understand. Well, this is the ultimate paradox and contradiction. But this, well, this is the very thing that God wants us to preach. Christ crucified. And there's a reason behind that. The believers or the church did not demand a sign or seek after human wisdom, but they preached Christ and him crucified what's that mean it means that he came was buried uh, what, what died was buried rose again for our sins he died our god our lord became a man and came and died for our sins that in him we can have forgiveness of sin and listen we don't have to be judged isn't that, isn't that, isn't that beautiful that christ came to take our place on the cross he was crucified he was suffering on that cross for you and I, the just for the unjust, taking our place, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He was paying for our sin. He became sin that knew no sin. He was taking our judgment. He was our substitute. He became our ransom. That's what Paul was preaching. And to some people, that's foolish. Give me something exciting. Give me a Hollywood style preaching. Give me something that's gonna tickle my fancy. Give me something that I want to hear makes me feel good. What do you mean, died for my sin? Am I a sinner? Yes. This is one of the problems in humanity today is they don't think themselves to be sinners because they're absolutely you know, governed by their own self-righteousness, thinking that their good works will justify their sin. Man's good work stinks in the eyes of God and the nostrils of God. Do you know why? Because even in their good, they want to be applauded and recognized. That's why Isaiah says, all our best, all our best, all our righteous, like filthy rags. You know, what God expects to be normal, we expect to be praised. And God says, no, holiness is normal. I am holy, you be holy. You don't get applause or you don't get credit for what you should be. And none of us are. We're trying and when we try, look at me, everybody. Look what I've done. And this is, you know... The definition of sin, self-righteousness, the arrogance of man thinking that what is normal in God's eyes needs to be praised by men. It's called self-righteousness and pride. And this is why the preaching of the cross exposes sinful people that they will come back and repent and turn to God by believing in His Son who died for them. But to some people, it's foolishness. Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And he's the person of our preaching. We're not preaching, follow Charlie, follow Paul, follow this, follow that. As a matter of fact, when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, he's just been an example. He said, you know, as I look to Christ and follow him, you should too. Follow him, follow the Lord. We preach the Lord. We're pointing you, Corinthians, not to Peter, not to Apollos, not to Paul, but to the Lord. What are you trying to separate the apostles? Trying to divide the apostles? No, Christ is not divided. The preaching that we preach is both to Jew and Gentile. And he's called all men everywhere to repent. 
He's the pinnacle of our preaching. He's the answer to man's sinful soul. And you need to continue to hearken to him. And the Corinthians now made men to be the idol. They were worshipping the personalities instead of the person of Christ. They lifted men. And I, by the way, brethren, this is a, a pandemic, if you want to call it, in our Christian movement today. And it, it is outstanding. I, there are people that have statues of, of, you know, of, of Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. Or, or, you know, pictures of them. You know, I came out of Catholicism. I know what that means. Worshipping saints. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Men-centered worship. You know, even in Christendom is idolatry. We're not talking about saying, oh, thank you for that. Thank you for preaching the Word of God faithfully. But it stops there. It stops there. That's where it stops. Because I know every preacher needs encouragement to keep on keeping on. Keep preaching. Keep going. Don't stop. No problem. But as soon as you uplift that person, and, 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 and by the way, you need to be very careful with doing that, lest you spread a net, you know, and, and that preacher gets a big head, and all of a sudden, you know, it's so easy done. I guarantee you. You need to be very careful. But Paul knocked it on the head. He dealt with it in the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians by saying, was Paul crucified for you? No, of course not. Were you baptized in Paul's name? No. So what are you making a fuss? Hey, listen, Paul, Apollos, we're nothing. It's God that gives the increase, and we have a privilege to take a part in God's prophetic plan of salvation that we're supposed to preach his son, and it's a privilege. As soon as you're just trying to compare people, that's, that's when it becomes a problem. Don't compare people. John the Baptist was a unique preacher to Barnabas. Don't compare them. God uses personalities. You know, this is what the world wants to do. Oh, we need more Barnabases and less John the Baptist. Oh, hang on a minute. God has, has placed every single person in his plan to preach his word in a way that pleases God. And people look at personalities. Don't look at personalities. Look at the person that we preach. That's what you should be looking at. I don't understand. Never understood it. Why they've got statues and icons of uh, these preachers that have gone and God used them. And I'm not saying that you know God can't use people and praise God for that. Let your light so shine before men that they may what glorify your God which is in heaven. That's the whole purpose. I think some of these saints would be rolling in their graves if they knew what people were doing today. And so we preach Christ. We preach not ourselves. You know, the preaching that we preach would only be the very thing that God commands us to preach from his word. You know, Jesus only preached, only preached what the Father told him to preach. In John 8 verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, when, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, look at this, I speak these things. As my Father has taught me, that's what I speak. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse 46, he says this, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall be judged the same ju shall judge him in the last day. Look at verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me gave me commandment what I should say and what I should what? Speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, look at this, so I speak. Micaiah was a faithful preacher in his day and will not compromise his message. As a matter of fact, King Ahab's servants tried to manipulate Micaiah and say to him, you know, all these other hundreds of prophets, they're all unified in one mind. And you know what, Micaiah, you should be too. They're telling Ahab what he wants to hear. 
They're prophesying good things to Ahab. You know what a good thing to Ahab was? You better, you better be prophesying what I'm planning to do. <laughs> I don't want to know the truth. As a matter of fact, when uh, the other king said, hey, uh, Ahab, is there any other prophets here that would, you know, kind of affirm what these prophets are saying? I mean, it's too, these prophets seem to be like compromising or whatever. You know, I said, oh, there's one called Micaiah, but I hate him. Why do you hate him, Ahab? Oh, because he never prophesies the very things that I want to do. That's why. He always prophesies against me. Well, have you ever found out, Ahab, that it is God that is preaching against you because you're a wicked king? That you want to do the very things that is in your heart? But notice what 1 Kings uh, 22 verse 13 says, And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spoke unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets. Declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. And speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. There it is there. And we're living in a society today that want the preachers to compromise the message and make it less judgment, less fire and brimstone, and more palatable and more enjoyable and preach comforting things, if you will. But the, the Apostle Paul wasn't like that. Man, if anybody was rude in his speech and his preaching, it was him. He said that to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11. He was rude in his speech, but there was a reason why. Because he wanted the Corinthians to get right. He was preaching and teaching to them because they were living in a way that was disgraceful to God. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you first all that which I want, received. He was a faithful preacher. Galatians 1, 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which I preach of me, uh, so the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. And you know what Paul said, my gospel oftentimes? Not because it was a dispensational, uh, you know, uh, division here between other apostles, that he had a different gospel and Peter had a different gospel. No, he would say my gospel to contrast it with the false prophets and preachers and apostles of the day that preached another gospel that was a false gospel. There's only one gospel, folks. There's only one truth. And that one truth centers around Jesus Christ. There's, you know, that, that one truth was from the beginning to the end, uplifting even in Genesis. The promise given in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the devil. And that, that crush, if you will, that destroying, if you will, happened at Calvary when he, when he died for the sins of the world. That's the wisdom of God right there. That's how God planned it all. Motivated by his amazing love for the world. That man will get an opportunity to repent and get right with God, even after living a life of sin. It's a blessing, not a curse. But you know what? Rebellious people, listen to this, rebellious people, people that are rebels, yes, people that don't want to know the truth, people that want their ears tickled, don't want to hear solid, firm preaching. And that, that's what it was in Isaiah's days. In Isaiah 30 verse 9 says that this is a rebellious people, look at this, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers or the prophets, see not. You know what they're saying? Turn a blind eye. The prophets see wickedness, Shh, pretend you didn't see it. Are you guys crazy? Don't you understand that God sees everything? He beholds the good and the evil. You know, who do you think we're working for here? Well, this is a rebellious people. I mean, this is disobedient people. Eat your heart out. People that are, you know, filled with lust and sin and don't want to repent. He says, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not to us right things. Now, we don't want you to tell us the truth. Please, don't preach to us the truth. Speak unto us. What's that word there? Smooth things. What are the smooth things? Prophesy what? What's that word there? Down right there to the bottom. Wow. I mean, who would ever think that? 
Who'd ever come to the point of their life saying, I want to hear lies. Tell me lies. Comfort my heart. Give me a fuzzy feeling. Tell me how good I am. Don't tell me how bad I am. Yeah, don't tell me that the world's going to end. Tell me, tell me more. Tell me like, you know, your best life now. God wants to prosper you and he wants the best for you and you're not going to struggle. You know, God wants to just, you know, you're make your God on earth. That's what we're hearing today in the prosperity gospel. And that's what people gravitate to. What do you think their mega churches flock to these people because they tickle ears, my friend. They, they turn their ears away from the truth. Why? Because they love me dudes, they love themselves. They don't love God, they don't love the truth. They want to hear, they'd rather hear lies than truth. Can you think about that for a moment? They'd rather be told lies than truth. Comfort our heart. Don't tell us we're going to go through tribulation. Comfort my heart. No, the Bible says we're going to go through tribulation, my friend. Much tribulation as Christians. You know why Christians don't face any tribulation in the Western countries? Because they don't know how to preach the truth. They don't know how to preach the gospel with conviction. They, it's called a social gospel. Come around them. You know, be nice to them. Don't condemn them. Don't make them feel bad. You know, create an atmosphere in church that makes them feel good and want to come back. <laughs> That's what we have today. That this are rebellious people. Oh, go to the next verse, sorry. Or is that, that, is that finished? That's finished. Rebellious people. I, I says, get you out of the way, turn aside, out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from us before us. This is the utter rejection of God and his pre appointed preachers. It's crazy. What did people want? What are they looking for? I'll tell you what they're looking for. They're looking for a political figure and a religious figure that would bring this false peace into the world. He's called the Antichrist. That's who they're looking for. They're not looking for Christ crucified. They're looking for conquering Christ that will give them their best life now. To be part of this one world movement. And finally the scum of the earth, we can shut them up. Because they're a thorn in the flesh of the world. That's what the Christians are. You know there's consequences when you preach thus saith the Lord. You know what they did to Jeremiah? They actually threatened to kill him. In Jeremiah 26 verse 8, after his preaching, it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, priests and prophets and all the people, took him saying, what did they say? Thou shalt surely die, Jeremiah. Are you guys serious? You have a man preaching the truth to you and you want to kill him? Well, they tried to get rid of him. It's a long story. They put him down in the dungeon, but there was one faithful man that stood up in that day. Mate, thank God for faithful men. Thank God for those few that don't go with the majority. Oh, they like to see preachers that preach the truth. They like to shut their mouths and shush them up. Why do you think they stoned the prophets? Uh, why do you think John the Baptist got his head cut off? Oh, John the Baptist never got his head cut off because he was involved in a political movement. You know, he was protesting and saying, I stand with this person, I stand with that person. You know what, John the Baptist, you know why he got his head cut off? Because he exposed the sin of others. He exposed the sin of others. Uh, think about it. Why did Jesus die the death that he did was it what was he crucified was he crucified because he fed the five thousand was he crucified because he healed the leper was he crucified because he raised the dead what was he crucified because he caused the blind to see no 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 listen he was crucified because he preached truth he said it very clearly to Pilate when Pilate said are you a king and he says you Say that I am. He said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that, they, that I should bear witness of the truth. 
And look at this, everyone that is of the truth, look at, look at, heareth my voice. And there are some people out there that want to hear the truth, which comes to our last point, the purpose for preaching in 1 Corinthians 1.21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, look at this phrase here, to save them that what? There it is. <clears throat> the ones that believe are those that hear his voice. Gravitate to the truth that was bid to every prophet in their day to speak the truth and they'll gravitate to it. There are a remnant, there are a remnant amongst those wicked people that hear the truth and want to follow Jesus. There's a remnant and I hope that you've become one of these people here today. You won't go with the majority, the wide gate that leads to destruction, but you enter in and strive in the narrow gate that leads to life through Jesus Christ. You'd come into the light. You repent. Trust Christ. And the whole purpose of preaching is that people would repent and believe the plan of salvation and the reason why God is delaying the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was He's not willing that any should perish. But all come to what? Repentance. I mean, this is the end goal of preaching. That's the end goal. I mean, if anybody preaches a message to see people condemned, I mean, that, that, that's wrong. Oh, you're going to go to hell and you deserve it and all this and not giving people any kind of hope. No, preaching gives people hope. Calling people to repent is God's heart of love for them to come back and get right. It's love. People don't like preaching is because they want to continue in their sin. How many times, and I've probably some of you can identify with this, how many times have you heard people say, and you haven't even used the word preaching. You're actually telling them about the love of God. And you're not even uplifting your voice at some times. And they say this, don't preach to me. <laughs> so, oh, I didn't know I was preaching. But you know, when you preach the gospel, Jesus being the only way, the truth and the life, and there's no other way. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. That's preaching. That's preaching. Hey, that's being forward. That's being truthful. People know that to be preaching. Why? Why do they know that to be preaching? I mean, come on now. Think about it. Because they're bothered by it. And it's doing what it's supposed to do. Reprove. Rebuke. Exalt. With all long suffering, you're actually even long suffering with them. You don't being mad at them. They're being mad at you. Because I don't want to hear it. Why? Because I love their sin. They're not ready to repent. They're not ready to change. They love their lust. They love uh, sexual relations with, uh, outside of a marriage covenant. They love looking at wicked stuff on the internet. They love it. They can't get enough of it. They love it. What do you think a rebellious child is rebellious to their father and mother? And they're stiff-necked to the instruction that they give because they want to do what they want to do. That's why they're rebels. That's why they won't hearken. They don't want instruction. They want to do what they want to do. And that's why people do not like preaching because it tells them, hey, you need to do it this way. You need people don't like authority. People don't like telling them what to do. But the end goal of that is life. The end goal of that is blessing. It's supposed to be anyway. It's supposed to be. Uh, Romans chapter 10, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. How then should they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in, whom, in, 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 in him of whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a what? Preacher. And how should they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And he says, but have they all obeyed the gospel? For, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So you know, even the prophets of, of old preached good tidings in their day and they had the same reaction that we have today rejection so then the bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing how by the word of god that's how faith is born by the preaching of the word that's what pleases god and that's what god uses to save them that what that, that what? Believe. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
For it is the power of God and the salvation to anyone that believed, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God. Therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God. For as it is written, it says here, the just shall live, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The purpose of preaching is this, that you will get saved and you'll start living by faith. You'll start obeying God and His Word. That's the whole end goal of preaching. The message of the cross sounds foolishness to them that do not believe in a perishing. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Even to you sitting here, you might be thinking, I can't wait to get out of here. Well, that's foolishness. Why? Because you don't want to believe and you're perishing. But to them, the unbelieving Greeks and philosophers thought the simple gospel message sounded foolish because the, 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 the Greeks sought after philosophy. They sought after wisdom, intellectual things. That, are, that, that in the gospel to them, it had no, there was no appeal. They were puffed up in their vast knowledge, collected for themselves, you know, uh, information, if you will, science so-called, trying to eradicate, perhaps even for some, there is no God. Why do you think that the vast growing religion today is atheism? There, there is no God. By the way, that's arrogance. Do you know why? At least you can say there is. How do you know there isn't? That tells me you're arrogant. And you know why? Because I want to continue to be comfortable in their sin. And so the prideful human wise man says, what do you mean crucified, suffered and died? What do you mean died for my sins? Doesn't see themselves to be sinful people. For the preaching of the cross is to them foolish. That perish foolishness. They're, but look at this. But unto us, which are saved, it is the what? It's the power of God. The message of the cross, Christ crucified to believers, means salvation. Unto us. To a saved believer, the simple, simple gospel message is the best thing that we've ever heard in our life. What do you think it makes us who we are today as believers? I, get, I came out of religion. I came out of living a pharisaical, sinful life. I came out of that. And I tasted 20 years ago that the Lord is good. I tasted and my relationship began and I saw his love and I'm in love with him. I am. I mean, he is the best thing that ever happened to me in this life. Why? Because I know the power behind the gospel and I know the value of what Christ did on that cross and the love that was, was bestowed upon us. I know it. I see it. Beautiful. He exposed my sin and I said, yes, I am. No, I'm not. No, I said, yes. And that day, he had mercy upon my soul. The humble, human, worthless man, worthless, wretched man says, crucified for me, suffered for me, died for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. There's a big difference. And the way you view the cross makes that difference. 1 Thessalonians 2, we see the testimony of the church in Thessalonica, people that believe the word of God to be the word of God. For this cause also, Paul says to them, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you didn't receive it as the word of men, he said, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you, that what? You know when the word of God starts working in you? is when you hear it and believe on it. And Paul acknowledged the fact that these people didn't receive it like from Paul. He says, this is God's word. It's God's truth. And throughout history, God used the method of preaching to call men repent and believe, despite their status quo. You know, we see Noah in his day called a preacher of righteousness. 2 Peter 2.5, the Bible says, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the unwho. The ungodly. This gives us a good indication that Noah was not only building an ark, but he was preaching the coming judgment. 
He was preaching the coming judgment. Preacher of righteousness. You know, we see in the last days the prophets of God, you know, were called to preach the coming judgment. And the false prophets would say, no, 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 no. Judgment's not coming. Like it is today. The coming judgment of God is coming? Oh, no, it's not. Ah, who said? Oh, no, it's not. Like it was in the garden. Eve, God says, you touch that tree, you will surely die. The devil says, oh, no, you won't. Doesn't change. It's still the same today. As a matter of fact, there was a rich man that ended up in hell because he rejected the preaching of the prophets. And as a matter of fact, he thought he had a better way to appeal to his family so they wouldn't come to a place of torment where he was. That's found in Luke chapter 16 and verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, talking to Abraham, Father, thou wouldest send me to my father's house, for I have five brethrens, brethren, that he may testify under them. Look at this. Lest they also shall come to this place of what? Torment. And Abraham said unto them, They have who? They have Moses and who? The prophets. Let them hear them. Notice this new way, if you will, of methodology. And he goes on to say, But nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will what? Repent. I mean, listen. Uh, miracles and visions and dreams is the way to go today, isn't it? That's how we're going to believe, isn't it? No. Miracles, visions, and dreams were never to take the place of the preaching of the word. They were to authenticate the word. Never take the place of it. And that's what we have today. People giving testimony. I saw a six-foot Jesus in my room. I had a dream. A man with a white suit. You know. And was there anywhere in that dream that you heard the preaching of the cross? Were you convicted of your sin? Did you repent? Because this other Jesus that we're hearing of is a Jesus that has no conviction. That's what we're hearing today. And then he said unto him, If, verse 31, they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. He solidifies it. If they're not going to hear preaching, you think they're going to believe one risen from the dead? They don't care. You can, you can split the sky open right now and Jesus can appear and you can see him what, like we're going to see in, in, in Revelation coming soon, people being judged for their sin and they're still being judged and tormented and you know what they're doing to him? <laughs> so you can split the heavens open right now and if your heart is hardened and you don't care about what's being preached today, you think that's going to change you? No way in the world. If the preaching of God's word doesn't soften your heart and humble you, nothing will. I need to see it to believe it. No, 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 no. Even if you saw it, you won't believe it because you're a lustful, sinful man that doesn't want to repent. Because I know my Bible. My Bible says God is pleased using the preaching of his word to call men to believe and repent. That's, how God, that's what God is pleased with. And if... If, if he's pleased with that method, guess what? It works. We don't need to change the method. We don't need to change the method. None of this reproof and rebuke and correct. I can't handle it. Shut up already. I said to a man two weeks ago, brother, when you end up in hell, you wish I was actually preaching louder. Stronger. Well, if you go and have a taste of hell, my friend, you'd probably say, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you, why didn't you keep going? And you know what he told me? Shut up already. Calm down. That's enough. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. The foolishness of preaching is what pleases God. Now, in closing, and I left it out on purpose, the preaching that the Lord bid Jonah to preach, what was it? Was it a spectacular message? What was it? 
Verse 4, Jonah 3, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried. In other words, he lifted up his voice. He cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh, Nineveh shall be what? Overthrown. Eight words in English. Five words in Hebrew. We'll stick to the Hebrew, the original. Five words. Message. God's going to destroy this place in 40 days. That was the message. That's all he said. That's all he kept saying. That's all he kept saying. What was their response? Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh, what did they do? Believe God and proclaim the fast and put sackcloth and from the greatest of them even to the least of them. That's, that's a sign of brokenness and repentance. They believed God. They believed his word. They believed what God was going to do in 40 days was going to happen. And you know, by the way, God had mercy upon them because they repented. And God wants to have mercy upon you if you repent and believe the gospel. There is a judgment coming. It's coming. But he doesn't want to judge you. He wants you to repent and get right. And he's made a way through the cross. Jesus said they repented at the preaching of Jonah. In uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 48, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with ge this generation. Why? And shall condemn it. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. That's why their judgment's going to be worse, because to whom much is given, much is what? Required. And the, and the people in the days of Nineveh are going to stand in judgment. It's almost like they're going to be there and say, hey, we, we repented, we believed. Look at you, stiff-necked, half-hearted, rebellious uh, people. You've got the Messiah right in your face. You've got God manifested in the flesh. You don't have Jonah. You have the one that commissioned Jonah to preach. You have the prince of preachers right before you. What is wrong with you, you stiff-necked, hard-hearted people? Your condemnation is going to be greater. Jesus is the one that commissions his own disciples to preach. In Matthew 10, verse 5, in the uh, and he sent the twelve, sent them forth, commanded them, saying, Go, that's authority. And he goes and says in verse 7, as, And as you, as you go, what, what's that word there? Preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what I want you to preach. Seven words in English. That's all. Hey, listen, the kingdom's going to come. You better get right with God. The kingdom's coming. That's what it meant. Get right with God because the kingdom's going to come. It's very near. Listen, it's, and, and it's right now, it's nearer than that was proclaimed 2,000 years ago. Like oh, You can even smell it. It's at the door. It's just right there with what's taking place in the world. Listen, and you're still sitting and you're still hard and you're still unmovable. Like, what is wrong? Well, just don't worry. Just don't worry. If they don't receive you, I'll tell you what to do. Jesus tells them to do these ones. And go to the next one. Wow. Why? Because that's judgment upon them. That's judgment upon them. They got a little taste of what's going to take place later. Rejection. You reject God, God will reject you. Simple. You're not God. And God's not moved by what you think of Him. Why? Because He's righteous. He's good. He's just. He's loving. He's kind. God is God. I stand with Him. I preach Christ crucified. The Lord of glory. The God who loved us. The greatest sin that you can ever commit is a rejection of God the Son. It's like spitting in His face. I pray that you won't do that today. What did John the Baptist preach? Repentance. Matthew 3, verse 7, But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees, he came to them and said, Oh, you beautiful puppy dogs. No, he says, Oh, you generations of snakes. He says, Who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. 
He preached. Warning. Repent. He says, bring forth therefore fruit meets to be repentance. Look at this in verse 9. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. You think because you're God's chosen people and you're the seed of Abraham that you're automatically going to get into heaven? No. You too need to repent. The foolishness of preaching is what pleases God. I'm going to close with this, and we'll look at this next week <clears throat> or the week after. We'll see perhaps how we go. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 to 5. He says, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of, word or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. Look at this. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the what? And what's the power of God on the salvation? The gospel. Only applicable to those that have a repentant disposition and faith in Jesus Christ. Next week, or the week after, we'll see how we go. I want to focus a little bit on what's the demonstration of the Spirit. When he came in by the demonstration of the Spirit, did they see Paul elevated? And uh, this eloquent man that spoke in the Spirit? Or is it still... The power, the simple foolishness of preaching of the cross that shook up that continent. And I would say it's the second. It's the cross, the simple cross, the message of the cross, and everything that it entails from beginning to the end. And I pray this morning, well, we're heading just in the afternoon, it's just 12 o'clock now. Please, I beg you. I beseech you, please don't ignore this. Please. God's working in your heart, and I believe he is. Every time you hear the message, the Bible says, harden not your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. Don't harden it, because you're only making things worse for you. It's only going to get harder. It doesn't get easier. I beg you, Come to Christ. Repent toward God. Get right with God. Believe on His Son. Be saved. And start walking by faith in His Word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.